So I'd like to welcome you both here. Um, Thomas and I will be discussing today uh, our article teaching scenario planning on in sustainability courses, the creative play method. Um, now, let me just go across. So my name is Dr. Belinda Wade. I'm a lecturer in sustainability and strategy in the business school at the University of Queensland. Um, and I also lead the school's research theme on sustainability. Um, and so my main research focus is around decarbonisation and how to motivate and accelerate a decarbonisation within companies and how we can help organisations sort of meet the challenges around climate change. Um, and that also incorporates new business models and, and approaches like circular economy and things like that. Um, and Thomas, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um... I, my current job is a bit different. Uh, my, my name is Tomas Piccini. I'm from Argentina. That's my, my accent. Um, I'm a program officer at UQ Ventures. UQ Ventures is an area in the University of Queensland that runs entrepreneurship activities. So really, um, but what my job looks like is running a lot of design session and design thinking with a lot of a lot of students, yeah. um, and, and really getting really creative about how we engage with them and uh, sort of uh, practicing entrepreneurial mindsets. Um, and uh, sort of enhancing that entrepreneurial spirit. And the university has a big emphasis on, on this um, and it's been increasing that. Uh, we think it's a really important set of tools for our students to have for the future. Um, so yeah, so that, that's really my passion as well, um, entrepreneurship and, and climate change and sustainability. So, so that's um, what we started to collaborate over there. Um, now, Bruce and Gabriella, you, you might not have had many Australian presenters, but it's very it's customary for us to um, form an acknowledgement to country. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the University of Queensland um, acknowledges the traditional owners. And in, in Brisbane, where we are, that's the Jagger and Turrbal people um, and their custodianship on the land in which we meet. And I'm sure you have different tribes and the lands where you meet. Um, but we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Um, and just in case you haven't had access to it, the article we're talking about today is, is this one. So if you want to, you know, if you finish and you want to, you know, have other questions, um, it's all written up in this article. So um, <clears throat> our session, uh, we, we, we're going to do a little bit of some acknowledges, of course, um, writing these um, articles involve a lot of people. And we think uh, we want to acknowledge those uh, that were involved in the process. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a background on, on how uh, this research started and how this whole project started around this new course also uh, that was um, part of the, the research. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the theory behind what we uh, sort of created and, and what's in, in the, the paper, we'll talk about the, the method and the stages that we go through and why we do it that way. Uh, we'll show you a little bit of the effectiveness of the method and some uh, of the feedback of the students and what the students have been uh, creating throughout the course. Um, we'll talk a little bit if we have time and because it's so intimate, we might, we just might uh, talk about the assessment pieces and how we, there's that potential to integrate and uh, we'll have some time for Q&A as well. So I think uh, we would like to acknowledge um, that the Journal of Management Education, of course, um, this, this special issue editor, um, Jorge Arevalo, I think that's sort of my, my Spanish kicks in and I'll do it in my Spanish, uh, and, 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 and the editor of the journal, so um, Gini Foray. The anonymous reviewers, of course, and, and uh, they helped uh, shape uh, as well and, and uh, write and, and improve the article. And, and uh, we had really great uh, reviews. Uh, the, the Faculty of Business, Economics and Law and the, at the University of Queensland, of course, uh, for providing the, the teaching and learning grant that uh, supported the development of this exercise and uh, the whole process, not just the, the paper, but uh, creating innovation in, in how we, we took this uh, to students. Uh, Social professional April Wright for her encouragement, the guidance, assistance in development of this article. She was um, really generous with her time in, in helping us uh, understand how to take this forward. And also big thanks to, to Sandra Figueira Oliveira, 
who uh, was a facilitator for the scenario planning sessions uh, and provided feedback on the workshopping uh, process as well. So they, they've all been really generous with their time. Um, so just as a little bit of background, because I know you, you're probably similar, Bruce and Gabriella, sometimes you inherit courses and then you come <laughs> and you teach them and you think, I really, I feel like the content is, is interesting, but it's just not being effective in the way it's being delivered. Um, and that was kind of my experience in taking over um, a course back in, was it 2017? So it's a course that's been taught, taught for quite some time, but I'm taking it over. I thought, well, it's great that they're incorporating scenario planning in the course content, but it really kind of, I didn't feel like it was done effectively. Um, and so it was part of this sort of review and redesign of, of the entire course and particularly this assessment piece, which was linked to scenario planning. Um, and there was quite a few challenges with the course. So it was a post-grad course, um, was growing, uh, well, I guess it was, you know, the numbers were growing a little bit, but not, you know, not hugely. So it probably had that sort of 40, 50 um, mark of students, but it was incredibly diverse. Like these students came from all over the world, um, but also all, you know, different backgrounds um, of in enrollment. So, you know, we had engineering students, we had science students, we had business students, we had, you know, all over the university um, and a lot of range of experience. Some were very experienced industry practitioners, others were just out of their, you know, undergrad. So we had this, you know, huge amount of um, variability within the cohort as well, we were trying to bring together. Um, and actually, Thomas was one of those students in that first year. So it was, you know, great to then be able to include him in this, you know, redesign process. Um, so Thomas, did you have something you wanted to share there? No, I, I think uh, that's a, a big part of how I think uh, this became such an impactful or successful process is that um, Belinda sort of had the courage as well, because sometimes it's uh, it's tough to get uh, some sort of other people involved, but getting uh, sort of for me was really great to be able to talk about the process as a research assistant with her and sort of pro providing this input as a student. Um, but at the same time, having this double hat, uh, learning how to do research as well with her. And so I think um, this is this was really a, a key aspect of the whole process and, and starting it the, the proper way. Uh, getting all the stakeholders involved. Yeah, and it was great to have your perspective, Thomas. And just for background, Thomas was an amazing student. You know those students who sits in the class and answers all the questions <laughs> at the debate and they'll guarantee to have no. an input in it. Um, so when Thomas was then looking for work as an RA and I got this you know, very small grant, I thought, perfect. He can get some research experience and we can tap into that enthusiasm around sustainability issues. So it was, you know, it was great from both perspectives to have Thomas on the team also. So Thomas, did you want to? Yeah, um, I'm trying, I get the, I'm moving the images, but um, I think, uh, uh, so, so like I mentioned, really having the design learning experience with the student in mind, and and that started with involving a student. I think that was that way. That's why it was so important. It is uh, really, really fundamental. And we sometimes build courses and content uh, sort of with the content in mind, right? And we need to tick some boxes and some learning outcomes. Uh, but but thinking about um, the student was really important. And like Belinda mentioned, uh, we have such a diverse cohorts in the University of Queensland, uh, in the masters especially. And so this was really, really important uh, to, to keep in mind. Uh, but at the same time, it's not just about experimenting and uh, innovating and then just uh, going off with um, with some crazy things. Uh, the robustness and the reviewing of it needs to be there. Of course, we are a university and uh, the researcher has to be there as well. And so that's that's why also this paper was important to, to to run and then um, always having that reflective component and to, to be able to adjust based on the experience. So what was working, what is not, and there has been iteration and uh, something have, some things have changed throughout the years uh, while this, this course was being run. I don't know Belinda, if you want to add anything to that, but. No, I think that's, I think that's good. We can answer questions um, you know, <laughs> later. Got any questions on the way it was um, developed? 
Um, but just in terms of linking in theory, because we are all academics, um, obviously there's been quite an um, established trend of using scenario planning within um, you know strategic planning and it's becoming a lot more integrated into you know government decision making you know even including the IPCC you know um, we're all very familiar with Shell using scenario planning for quite a long period of time and I think it's it's a really effective tool so one of my research passions is around cognitive framing and the way that we make decisions particularly around decarbonisation and, and impacts um, on, on that we're having on climate change um, and so that cognitive framing element was really something I thought was valuable in terms of the way you could reshape your, your framing of a situation, um, but not but through, a I guess, an experiential learning tool. So that part of scenario planning and it's not it's focus away from predicting the future, but on exploring the future and challenging your assumptions about the future in a in a really experiential way. Um, that could then shape the decision making was was really um, really appealing to me as both a learning tool and something the students could then take out into their sort of practitioner um, experience when they left the university. Um, so to me, it was it, it was really effective and a valuable addition to the course if we could get the students to be able to do it well and effectively. Yeah, I think um, creativity. <clears throat> we usually. We, we brush over it, right? And not everyone does creativity the same way as well. And so uh, we have also, also this, this cognitive and non-cognitive diversity in the classrooms. And, and, and it's really important that um, <clears throat> we worked on this creativity aspect because it, it like we, we've sort of having the slide there, it, um, it was a, a critical, plays a critical role in, in, in innovation and problem solving, especially in complex situations. And, we, we would just brush through it. Usually we just um, bank on um, putting out there some sort of exercise that will require creativity. And while we were talking about this, we were discussing how can we prime students, if, if we may, right? In, into being creative. How can we make sure that we allow everyone to be creative in their own way and we acknowledge for these differences. So we needed to find a method that was uh, flexible enough to allow people to uh, start to explore their own creativity. And especially in, in um, sort of higher degree sort of courses and uh, the, these masters, MBAs, where a lot of this creativity gets hampered by case studies that have set rules and, and there's, there's a way and method and pathways to solve these things. And that's, that's we want students to learn this too, right? There's frameworks to that work and have been proven to work. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to bring up this creativity so that we can complement that. And we can use these frameworks in a uh, creative, sort of a innovative way. And so creativity was a fundamental aspect, I, I think, in, and that's why it's sort of even like half of this process is all about um, priming that creativity because otherwise whatever comes after, um, yeah, it's flat and it, predictable it, and not exactly. useful. Exactly, yes, yeah. yes. And, you know, I, I always uh, we were just talking with Belinda about um, some of the scenarios that I built when I was doing the course, and then she's seen this happen over time. In how, uh, if you'd ask a student to be creative, even if we do the exercise now, and what what the world is going to be like in in five years, right? And if we ask that question five years ago, it's <laughs> hardly anyone will go like, "Oh, we won't be able to travel overseas." Um, so, what does the world look like if we don't travel overseas? And and it's really hard to go there, even even if we force it, it's really hard to go there, right? And so the creativity component was very, very important to, to sort of start to feed it in a way so yeah. that students can get there easier. That's right. And that's what's missing, I think, from a lot of the scenario planning activities. They just don't develop that section. So you go straight into the practical, step it out, and it, you know, you don't necessarily end up with an optimal um, result and I think when you're explaining scenario planning as a concept to to people, it can seem really straightforward. And you think, oh, that'd be easy to do. But in actual mm -hmm. fact, it's kind of a craft, and it's not as easy as it would, you know, seem when you're just reading it on paper. Yes, I, I think um, I wonder, and, and we can move to this, but just just this thought. But I, I think 
uh, probably humans don't want to go there, right? We don't want to be creative in that way. So, so thinking what uh, what the world would look like if if all these sort of natural disasters and climate change come to fruition, even though we we kind of know like we'll have some some very important impact already, and we will continue to have more disasters and more often. Uh, and so there is that resistance to go there. And so this creativity is sort of starts to work there. So um, yeah, so we this creative play method we, we're using here for, for scenario planning, that's, that's sort of a little bit of why we're using that. Um, the, the target course was postgraduates, which here in Australia, at least very diverse, very multicultural with very different type of, so the diversity is really not just uh, Anglo-Saxon diversity. It's, we have from Asia, we have people from, from uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon countries from South America. So very, very different cultures, very different types of learning, uh, of expressing themselves. Um, um, we run it in two stages, even though we do suggest in the paper uh, some alternatives on how to run it with shorter classes or how to run it in, in a one single uh, sort of workshops. And it has two stages, stage one, all about unlocking creativity, making sure that we have a, a good mindset to go into the scenario planning. And then the stage two is using that creativity and transitioning, sort of harnessing all that, uh, which is primed and using that for the, the development of the scenarios. So the, the learning, we have four key learning objectives, although surely a lot of other things happen uh, as students uh, start to interact with these type of activities. Uh, and first and first foremost, it, it was to develop this understanding of how complex it is to work uh, and promote in sustainability, right? And these complex uh, systems that are interconnected, it's a it's, um, very complex, um, very complex to understand uh, with, with if, if you don't go sort of purposefully with the right tools uh, around it. And so developing that understanding was, was important as, as a key learning uh, objective. Um, then of course the skills uh, around creativity and research and finding that uh, sort of switch around being able to use both to find uh, solutions to sustainability uh, issues. And promoting student confidence. And I don't know if you've had this experience with students that you've taught before, but um, the, the confidence in speaking and even just the practice in speaking, um, sometimes presenting it's not normal in other cultures, it's something not usual. And so promoting this confidence was uh, a big part of them being able to present this, especially because they'll be asked to do this in their future of work, if they need to present these scenarios, if they need to, um, th there's this key component here, which is, uh, sometimes you need to pitch this, uh, I'm using my entrepreneurial sort of language, but you need to present this and convince people uh, that these scenarios can happen. And so you need to be a confident speaker so that you can present this uh, sort of to a board of directors or someone to allow some resources to, to go into uh, mitigating these risks. And then um, the, the enhancing the ability of students to work effectively as, as a team and uh, not just as an, any team, but as a team that is diverse. Uh, and really, and, and this goes into a lot of the debriefing uh, that we do throughout the process that we'll look at, them understanding how that diversity enables the tackling of complex problems. And that cannot be done if we all think the same way. And it is tough and it is hard to work in diverse teams, uh, but if we can work through it, then uh, the upside is fantastic. So, so stage one was like we mentioned, and I think we've sort of beaten this drum uh, a lot is this unlocking the creativity um, to, to work effective and, and working effectively as a team. So there's a, a team creation component where there is a time to talk and, and there is a very purposeful time to talk about why diversity is important and we encourage that. We had the conversation with Lilina, still remember this about do we, force them into diverse group to we let them choose and um, it is uh, it was it was quite a conversation and and uh, I'm curious to see if other people want to ex experiment with this we let um, students form those groups themselves mostly because of 
if you rush them into discomfort too early and they have to work with people that they don't know too early and too much discomfort can be a bit jarring. But um, there is a moment there to talk about how diversity will create better outcomes, enable creativity, enable uh, um, things that you cannot do if we all think the same way. Uh, and then we get... We Sorry, do. Yeah, no, no, I was just also going to say, we do kind of encourage this diversity by giving them almost diversity criteria. Yeah. So, they, you know, you get a certain points for, you know, gender neutrality or, you know, difference in school of development. So we do kind of, yes, they have some choice, but we do have parameters around it so that they can perform what we call a sort of diverse and sort of successful team. Um, but also very much like Thomas is saying, the benefits of diversity, not so that, oh, well, this is going to be difficult, you know, sort of approaching it from a different perspective. Sorry, Thomas. Oh, that's that's great. Now I had forgotten, um, we, we found that sort of middle ground. And, um, but I think it's, what's significant here is uh, spending the time to explain them why it's important. And that's, that's uh, something that was great as well, I think. Um, so yeah, so we, then we jump into a legal serious place, which is, uh, fantastic! Was, I love Lego, of course, and um, uh, and so this op this is an open source method uh, that is used for communication, expression, and, and problem solving. Uh, it is a fantastic method to allow people to think about abstract uh, notions and components. It allows students and and people in general. It's used for for many many different things. It allows people to talk about themselves or feelings or emotions in a sort of third person describing an object, which makes it a lot easier uh, to talk about and less uh, vulnerable. So if you have to do this for a group of people that you've known for a few weeks, it, it really helps a lot. And uh, using hands, using your fingers has sort of been proven and done. I can't, I should probably quote this, but uh, it's in the paper in how it, it helps enhance creativity and, and sort of thing happens in your brain when you start to, to get out. And I think also it's just um, as a student experience for me, uh, you come into these sort of masters of business and, and you are in this uh, business school and then suddenly you arrive to, to a class and there's Lego on the table and you're like, wow, so what's going on? And it immediately switches and, and this, um, this will create a, a change. Um, and then we have different steps uh, to, to ease students into these. There's an icebreaker. Sorry, Thomas. Um, no, that's so good. I'll just rush, brush through them and um, we'll keep going because I want to be conscious of time. Um, we have an icebreaker and then we first have them work individually and then they have to combine structures. And so we slowly give them time to think alone, think together and start to describe and use the method all to arrive to this innovative structure that they all have to put together. And the debriefing is important so that they understand why we do Lego and not just it's not just about playing, uh, but there's a, a madness to the method, a method to the madness. I can't remember how the phrase goes, but yeah, we do this for a reason, I guess. And, and so these are the times really, I think we just put it there so uh, you can refer to the, the paper if you need to specifically look at how we broke it down uh, into the different components. There is some uh, pre-work that students need to do in looking at some videos and, and sort of this flip sort of classroom type of uh, methodology where uh, we put the videos for them to look instead of playing in, in the classroom and then the classroom is more about them sort of experimenting with the method. That's right. And it's, it's really about challenging them to, um, I guess, to work together as a team, but also, you know, we sort of impose things on them. They might, we give them parameters about how they need to use certain amount of blocks in a certain time to build structures, but then we'll tell them what that is, you know, like some sort of sustainability challenge. And they have to think quickly on their feet for what it is and why it's, you know, important in terms of sustainability and things like that. Um, so I guess it's quite different in the way that we normally have students approach a situation where we give them a challenge and then they create the solution, but we almost sort of flip it around so they have to be this sort of enforced innovation and forced the way that they all have to speak out loud about something. Um, and I think it can be really challenging, but it actually has been really um, powerful in terms of not only driving the creativity, but also cementing them as a team 
So if you put a diverse group of students together who don't really know each other and don't necessarily feel comfortable, this sort of process um, was just incredibly powerful in terms of creating this cohesive team which had a real bond um, with it. Um, and we also had, you know, challenges. Some of them were more on icebreaker, but we did award, you know, they got awards or, you know, they, we, did, we did make it fun as well as, as, you know, something around creativity. Sorry about that. I, my computer started to shut down in front of me. <laughs> like, oh, okay. No. All good, I Thomas. I have to go fly it. <laughs> Uh, and we thought we'd include some some photos um, of the students doing the challenges. This is our facilitator in the middle here, who's you know, doing one of the icebreaker challenges and measuring it. Um, and students are very competitive, I have to say, about who's winning these sort of things. Um, yeah. And we, we set them some challenges around, you know, once they've joined all their team structures together, we tell them it's the house of the future and they have to think back on all their learning through the semester about what are the challenges of climate change and listing out all those innovations they've incorporated into their house when in reality is they've created a massive weird block creations but then they have to look at it and think well what could it be in terms of meeting these challenges they've no you know they know exist um you know because they've learned about it or you know for the first half of the semester um so i think down that left hand corner you can see one of the you know challenges of of the house of the future so we do incorporate it into what we've been learning over the semester um and part of this course is around um innovation um and we bring in the the business model canvas so we also bring in that type of thinking around sustainability challenges how would you develop a business model and then we get them to explore it on the you know the business model canvas as well so it really is embedded in what we're um you know exploring through the rest of the semester so then of course the second we come to the second um stage where we have you know the, the next session and we are getting those students to really harness that creativity to um, develop a creative scenario um, for a case study company. Um, so the case study companies which we try and look for are things that the, you know, they're, they're sort of defined. The students are quite often familiar with them. Um, so at the local airport, we've done one on our, our university. So it's a situation they're very familiar with. There's information that they can research, but the boundaries are, you know, defined. So it's not a multinational company. It's, you know, it's got a defined area of operation. They, you know, they can research it and they can find out about it. Um, and we try and, you know, we, we, we're very clearly stepping them through the process of how to, you know, understand the system. So we get them to, you know, work on, you know, a pestle analysis for the, um, you know, for the company in question. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to build in this creativity. So they're not just coming up with these predictable factors, which, you know, you, they may ordinarily have just gone to when thinking about, um, you know, what's, what's happening. Um, so the question I like to, the scenario setting I try and um, get the students to think about is, it's a climate change future and it's, they, we either, theme it from an opportunistic, um, oh, sorry, an optimistic, which is obviously a low emissions future or a pessimistic, which is a high emissions future. And they have the overarching assumption that the case company is still operating at this point, um, which we set 50, um, 30, you know, 30 years in the future or 50 years in the future, depending on, you know, what we're thinking about. Um, and then we have these four steps, which we get them to work in with. Um, so part of it is obviously that that introduction into scenario planning, why it's important, that type of thing. Um, but then we get them to analyze the system and we've set, you know, in a pre-work situation, this, this analysis, this pestle analysis within their group. So they've already started working together as a group. They come in with, you know, some knowledge of the system in which the company is operating. Um, and, but then we step them through the process of how, you know, identifying the most impactful factors within the system that, you know, may, they may need to think about. Um, and then we talk them through this process of creating this combination of factors, um, which can be quite challenging. So they might be things around technology and technology availability or advancement. If it's something like an airport, it might be around um, the social acceptability of traveling large distances. So there, we pull out these things that they've noticed within their pestle analysis um, in each category, and then they as a team need to decide 
how they're going to choose two factors which are going to really define their scenario. Um, and we can show you a diagram a little bit later on how we get these teams to sort of place their individual team scenario at this combination um, of these two main factors. So once they have then worked out this, this factor combination, we get them to think about events that could have occurred between at this point in time now and a point, um, say 50 years in the future. So how it could have played out that we've got from where we are now to this point, either we've been amazingly successful in creating a low emissions future and it's defined by these this situation that they've worked out with factors, or we've been amazingly terrible and we've got a huge amount of climate change. Um, now, obviously, thinking about those futures, we also encourage them to research things like the IPCC reports. Um, and so they're, they're, they're actually still embedding a, a academic knowledge in developing these scenarios. They're not just random airy fairy, fairy tales. They're actually linked to research um, and knowledge. So I would too, I thought, you know, just in terms of actually making it real, I wanted to share with you a scenario. This is not the whole assignment. This is just the scenario part of one of our student groups. I did ask these students for permission to show you the video and they were very happy to share it with you. Um, so this was done for a major airport in Brisbane, Queensland, and the group um, named their scenario Crisis, a fairy tale of economic growth. And I know this, this transect is a little bit small, but what they've used to uh, cross is um, travel demand. So high levels of travel demand at the, the top part and um, constrained travel demand at the bottom. Uh, and then on this axis is around technology. So they have fossil fuel based technologies on one end and sustainable technologies. And they've placed their scenario um, at this point of a star so we've got some level of constrained travel demand and we're, we're getting that sort of emerging sustainable technology future. Um, so I will now hand it over to the students to tell you their scenario. And they managed to do this as a group and they, they produce these videos, which is, a, to be honest, I'm always amazed at the quality that they come up with. Crisis, a fairy tale of economic growth. It is 2050 and the world temperature has risen 3.1 degrees. How did we get here? After Paris Agreement, countries only followed their nationally determined contribution without fully committing to the 1.5 degree scenario. Those fell short to avoid severe impacts on the world's natural and social systems. Social strikes became more frequent and violent, with people all around the world claiming climate justice and behavior change. By 2022, a global financial crisis created by an energy breakdown put at spot the exposure of many corporations to this market transition risk. Not prepared to the sharp drop of stranded assets, many corporations suffered huge monetary losses constraining global economic growth. As a response, governments developed stricter regulations to control emissions and foster renewable energies, banning fossil fuel-based energy. However, it took them too long to implement enforcing mechanisms. Corporations continued their path towards low emission technologies, yet following a slow scaling pace due to economic viability and low regulation enforcement. Only by 2030, they became mainstream. By 2035, high snow peaks disappeared, threatening the water availability for millions of people. Polar ice kept melting and the first episode of ice-free Arctic Ocean took place. The consequent sea level rise caused human displacement and billionaire infrastructure losses. This, combined to ocean acidification, caused the disappearance of over 80% of coral reefs worldwide. The price of fresh water went up consistently over the years. Extreme weather events and highly speculative water commodity market triggered in a fresh water crisis, leading to a world where three quarters of the population lived under water stress or chronic water shortages. In Australia, Mining and coal energy sectors led the national economy to a short-term success and the environmental damages were too costly. By 2050, the whole country is suffering the consequences. Queensland and the city of Brisbane, which during its years of splendor vibrated full of life along the river, just remained with little of its past extraordinary nature. Bush fires, heat waves, cyclones, floods and droughts became more frequent and severe than ever before and its main natural asset, the Great Barrier Reef, is almost completely dead. Okay, so you can see what you know some of our student groups 
they've managed to come up with um, during these periods. And hopefully you could see that, that there were, it was not necessarily predictable, but they had actually factored in some things which we can see in the future and we can we hear about tipping points you know on climate change we you know we can see these the social issues arising um so i i think you can see that they I've, they've done some research to come up with this but they've produced it in a way where um it's linked to that sort of end point and remember this is tied to a airport in brisbane so when they bring in the reefs obviously our tourism is very much linked to these things so you know you can see that their research and their creativity has sort of come together to produce a scenario that they can then use to stress stress test the strategies um, you know that the airport is operating under so i know i we need to leave time for questions so i'll just run through this sort of quickly but the effectiveness of the of the method so Obviously, we need to know if it's working or not working. We have this sort of anecdotal evidence that we can see this progression and that it's improving. But what we did is um, we got ethical clearance to go back and examine assessment pieces. And so we had like two years um, pre-intervention. So when it wasn't taught in a structured way and the students needed to just do their scenario planning. And then we had two years post-intervention. And you can see the student numbers and the courses are growing through this time as well. Um, and then we analysed under a series of, of factors under the scenario construction and the scenario story. Um, so we, we analysed every assessment piece um, under these factors appropriate, sorry, under these categories, once appropriate of factors, logic of factors, novelty of critical events, um, and then, you know, the scenario story imaginativeness and sightfulness of event links. Um, and the overall meaningfulness of the scenario which is constructed. Um, and obviously what was being produced after the intervention, when it was very structured, designed to create creativity, um, was a lot stronger than what the students were producing before the intervention point. Um, we also surveyed the students from um, 2018, 2019. So these are the students who had gone through the, the redesigned process um, we got a nearly 16% response rate, which I think is fairly typical of responses given that a lot of the students have, have left the university, so it can be hard to contact them on their student email address. Um, and we used a five point Likert scale to evaluate their experience. So 71% agreed or strongly agreed that the Lego activity helped their teamwork, cohesiveness and creativity compared to you know, similar activities completed in other programs. Um, we also asked them to reflect on their own creativity um, and the you know, vast majority of them reflected that it did increase their creativity. Um, and interestingly, and this was the part I was really interested in um, as well, was, the, was whether the students were utilising the skills when they you know, left the course. And 75% said they were utilising those skills in scenario planning either in their current employment and studies. And in, we gave them sort of a free text box to explain further. And they were linking it to things like, you know, they finished their studies, they went for a job in a consult, major consulting firm, and they were able to utilise these skills as, as practical examples of what they could do within the firm. Um, and then, you know, on their ongoing um, employment. Um, and I thought this, this quote that we got back from one of the students was really um, quite topical. So I said, um, at the time I knew scenario planning was important, but I've now realised how vital it is to business success. How crazy to think that last year I might have said a world pandemic was an unlikely scenario for a company to plan for. Little did I know, ha ha ha. In all seriousness, scenario planning isn't so important for everyone to learn. I wish there was a course like this in my undergraduate program. Further, I use the knowledge I've learned every day in my workplace as I work in technology and innovation, which is always changing and very susceptible to world events. So. This is, you know, I think, and there were a number of these um, these responses we got back um, from students. Um, and some of them, the first time we ran this um, activity, it wasn't for an airport, it was for the university. And I myself reflect back on what the students were doing. And a lot of it was around what happens if students can't travel? What happens if no one can come to the universities? And I think, well, it's playing out. like. This was seen as something which may be a bit of a, wow, that's, you know, a scenario in the future, but these things that they were coming up with 
we're actually really close to where we are sitting at the moment. So, you know, really, you know, it's been a really interesting journey. Um, now, given the time, we might turn it over to you guys and ask, ask for questions rather than going on into any further detail. Any observations, any suggestions? We're happy. No questions. I don't know if we can hear um, that. Hi. Um, I'm just down the road from you guys at Griffith. Uh, hey. Hey, hello. <laughs> um, I've used Lego Serious Play quite a bit too, but um, yeah, how did you go? In the last, like I see the data is from 2019. So, so what did you, did you switch, to, you know, was this, and I'm sorry, I came in a bit late. So I'm assuming this was a post-grad course. Yeah, it was a post-grad course. Um, so is your question around online learning? Yeah, yeah. And it was, I have to say, it's much more challenging. This was actually got through, um, you know, it had gone through the majority of the, publication process before, you know, we got to sort of looking at that point. Um, we did run it uh, last year and I, like it was more challenging, but what we did is we, pre we prepped the students right from day one of the course that there will be this group task. Um, we will be running a session with around creativity with Lego and we gave them five weeks and asked them to purchase just a little box of Lego, just a little cheap or blocks. And we gave them alternatives that if they couldn't do Lego, that they could they get some plasticine or something like this that they could use and to develop their creativity. Um, yeah. And then we put a lot of effort into how we would actually get them into their groups. Obviously it was over Zoom and we put them in their breakout rooms. Um, and obviously I have PowerPoint slides. I run through every class for every step. Um, I created pre-recordings, so the instructions of me talking and the slides um, were then embedded for each group in a Padlet um, page. So we tried to create that we're in the room feeling as much as we could by using Zoom, by using these individualised Padlet pages that all the team members could be showing or uploading their um, pictures or video to at the same time. And for those few students who didn't manage to have Lego or anything, um, I created a little, almost like photo book of Lego creations that they could then select from for each activity. Um, so they weren't then, then left out. So we did everything we can, we could to facilitate this same level of creativity. Um, you know, obviously nothing is the same as having students in a classroom um but they did well and to their credit they still engaged you know in the process so and um you you published this paper and where is it published yeah let me let me go back to the link yeah, sorry sorry where are we there we go so it's in general oh. management education yeah oh, cool. so it, we've you know, we worked really hard with the editors in That's putting fantastic. in enough detail that you could hopefully execute it, but n not so much detail, which was overwhelming, which is was actually, to be honest, really difficult, you know, because the reviewers kept asking for more and more detail and we kept putting it in. And then we got to the point where we went, oh my goodness, this is so convoluted and long. Um, and we had to, you know, we relied on, on April. We said, can, we, can you read this? and say you know what what do you think should be removed i mean we've got to this point where there is just so much in it um we needed someone with fresh eyes to sort of look at it so it was challenging to write i'm interested in the um the video that you showed us what what's the assignment like how much of the that are they doing in real time during the class or how much are they doing after the fact Okay, so we get to this point in the classroom. I'm going to find the, I did put some slides which I haven't shown on what the assessment piece is. Uh, um, so we give them this assignment brief. We say that their team, uh, you know, these 
consultants for the company sustainability group and they're required to develop a long-term climate change innovation strategy and we give them a specific area of sustainability to manage so it might be water it might be energy it might be waste so each team has a different focus within the um, problem um, and we in the actual um, workshop they get to the point where they have that uh, sorry this crossover transect developed. So we've stepped them through the process of we've created this team pestle. So everyone's got, you know, a decent foundation. They then identified what they think will be the more meaningful factors. And then we, we in the workshop, help them to um, think about what would be a challenging but plausible combination of factors to define their scenario. Um, and we work with them on that so that they're not coming out with something that doesn't make any sense, you know, so we're helping them on that process. Um, and then we get them to think in their teams about what these events could be that, you know, happen between now and in the future, but that's done within their teams. We just help them, we generate the thinking and make sure they're on the right tracks. So they leave the class and they have a, I guess, a general outline of what their scenario story will be. They've got this endpoint. They then take it away and they create that, that video like you've seen. Um, but that's not the whole assignment. We obviously, they're trying to examine an issue within the company. So if it's around water, they've had to do research for, you know, water usage, for example, Brisbane Airport Corporation, what the challenges are. Um, they have to do sort of research on that we ask them to then examine the, I guess, the vulnerabilities of the airport itself and particularly around that sustainability issue based on their scenario that they've come up with. So that scenario video um, and develop some innovation or something to alleviate the problems or meet the challenges, but around their water usage and explore it through the business model canvas. So what they end up with is if when it was face to face, we used to get them to stand up and do a PowerPoint presentation and have their scenario video. Last year, the whole thing was a pre-recorded, I think seven or eight minute video um, that they would deliver, you know, as if they were a management consulting firm. Um, so the scenario is a really important part of their assessment, but it's not the whole assessment. Some of the marks are for the scenario story. But given it's a sustainability, um, a corporate sustainability type of course, we're getting them to then apply the scenario to their um, particular challenge that they've been assigned. Well, they, did Brisbane, like in the situation with Brisbane Airport, did the mm. did Brisbane Airport actually um, look at the report? Do they? Yeah. Yes, they came and attended and gave feedback to the students. Did yeah. they? pay attention to it, to the report? They, well, they said there were things that they hadn't actually identified as being potential issues. Like I think the students identified this concept that was coming out of Scandinavian, we had Scandinavian students at the time around flight shame um, and the social, you know, you know, whether that would be a big issue in the future that, you know, it would just not be socially acceptable to take flights. And I think the airport had not properly considered that that may be a big issue defining you know what the future of air travel was like um yeah. so there were yeah there were things that were coming out which they hadn't necessarily considered yeah i teach business ethics in undergrad and it's always interesting having um scandinavian students in the room mm. Mm. Yeah, we look like we're working in the dark ages <laughs> yeah <laughs> They can't understand a lot of the students in those countries. They can't understand why um, they go to the refractory area at the universities and they get all the food in plastic containers and then they're meant to sit on the ground or wherever. They just don't understand that concept because they're, you know, from the time they're teeny tots and go to school, they sit at a table with non disposable cutlery and plates. At the end, they scrape their waste into the right place and they put it. So they, this whole way we've designed our systems around creation of plastic waste and single use plastic is completely foreign to a lot of students. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they recycling is basically, it's part of their DNA. Mm, mm. 
whereas we're mm. still trying to educate people. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Or a comment than anything, I love the way that you've combined the creativity and then the scenario analysis. That's a I've I've done pieces separately, but I'm 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 still in this, you know, <laughs> for, for class in the fall. I love I love this approach. Um, the the other comment I would make is I had a lovely, you know, you do some of your best work by mistake. Um, yeah. I had I had had a session where students were reading about one of the depressing UN studies and then a very depressing US study um, and it had a very low energy conversation. And the next day there was the next time the class met, there was kind of a screw up so people hadn't really read what I had assigned. And they went, oh God, all right, how do I tap dance for an hour and a half? And I ended up realizing that there was a morale problem effectively. And so I just, uh, I, I gave each, each, it was a small class, like 10 students. They had two teams and I just gave each team some flip chart paper and I said, draw me a, a, a low carbon or no carbon city. That was my instructions in, in Toto. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me like I was speaking some foreign language, but eventually they got into it. And eventually I had a meeting to go to a half an hour after the class was done. And I had to ask them to turn off the lights because one team had created a, a fictitious city. And, you know, I said, well, you know, can we have a lake? And I said, you got the pen, um, you know, and, and the other, the other team redesigned San Francisco to be a, a low car impact thing. And what I noticed was that the, the emotional state uh, mm. after I'd asked them to be creative was just mm. night and day difference. Mm. Um, and I'm sort of, okay, I stumbled that on, on that by accident. I'm glad to see that somebody's really thoughtfully, you know, in a research-based way done this. <laughs> so, mm. uh, Bruce, there's um, I don't know if you heard of Kaos Pilot. Uh, they're out of sort of What's it called? Uh, Denmark, I think, Kaos Pilot. It's written with K. Okay. So it's K-A-O-S. -K um, they have this concept of, so they're sort of like a leadership management sort of alternative type of okay. um, business school. But what's interesting is they have developed this uh, learning arches concept, cool. which is nothing too novel, like we've been doing this forever. Cool. But they have a really interesting component, which is, so you have the arch and we usually finish an arch and we start a, a new arch straight and they have a loop underneath. And oh. so it's really important to them that when you land an arch, you have a loop that will tie it to the next. And when we're talking about how to combine creativity and so doing that uh, little loop that ties to the next step very purposefully, I think it's really important. Mm. In your case, you were just happened because you had to improvise, but I think yeah thinking about how the energy of the students is going to be even thinking about the time of the day where you're running the sessions and yeah. taking into account, especially sustainability. And, and I was a sustainability student no long ago, not long ago. And, uh, you know, you might get three hours of very depressing news and research. And so uh, asking them to be very creative after that is, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. You need that energy up first. And so thinking about those loops that will lead to the next exercise and carrying on from what you're using before is really, I think it's really important. And that's why when the scenario planning is done, we bring along the creativity aspect very purposefully with a lot of uh, clear communication about why, and one way of doing that is the clear communication of why, why all this Lego is happening and uh, what is the outcome, you know, and they take pictures of the, the, the structures. And then, so when we go into scenario planning, you, you have to think sort of about and carry these things forward with you. Mm. And it's not just one concept and the next concept and the next concept. And so sort of you tie it all together. And so this learning artist and I went to this, yeah, who was really insightful. I think uh, we, we kind of do it already, but I think uh, just having that very purposefully done, planned into a session. Mm.
can be quite hey, impactful. Thank you for that link. I'll I'll, I'll look that up because I, I, I'm very conscious that I'm trying to manage the emotional experience because an awful lot of the environmental stuff is just well. Let's see how depressed I can really make you. Mm, yeah. yeah. You know? And that paralyzes people. And so, yes. like, I want, I want the opposite. How do I yes. energize them? Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yes. I, hear I find in my courses, I try not personally, but you know, you do have to sit. You do have to give them the depressing stuff. Mm -hmm. And then after about the second lecture, I go, okay, there you go. You've got all the depressing stuff. Now the rest of the course is around innovation and how we create this change and why and moving forward and things like that. But it is, you just feel it in the room, how um, powerless that they can feel when they actually have the true knowledge of where the sort of situation has landed. Now I'm just, uh, you know, just in case we get cut off, I'm not trying to leave, but I'm just, thinking, I think the Zoom suddenly will cut off at some point, um, possibly about now, because I think we're one minute over it. But if it does cut off, I just wanted to have an opportunity to say a very big thank you to you all for being yes, here. Thank and you. Thank with you. Us. This is great. Yeah. It's good to actually talk to people who are thinking about our, you know, research. Thank you very uh, much for the presentation. I just have one question, actually. Um, I, it's a, it's imagining a scenario. So especially when you add creativity to it, my first question as a student would be, how can you choose just one, right? Uh, everything and anything can happen. So how do you choose what to do and focus and create one scenario? So we get students to actually create a number of these, which you can see on the screen now. So we get them to create a, you know a couple of them because obviously it, you know it takes a while to get one which actually sort mm -hmm. of works um and given they're then in groups we get mm -hmm. them to to discuss it and we set them the challenge we say well it should be um you know it should be something which you think is challenging um but you know something which is still a little bit some is plausible so that they can actually really see how it could play out and really engage mm -hmm. with the scenario. Um, so, so students don't necessarily come up with the first scenario they come up with is the best scenario. We, you know, mm -hmm. we get them to explore it a little bit before they sort of tighten down on one scenario. And it's a democracy in the group. They've got to work out mm -hmm. which they, you know, like best. I think it's important. Uh, so there's boundaries of, of course that are set because sometimes in a sort of too much freedom, the students can get paralyzed. And so there are boundaries around what the world will look like and how to go about it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's really important, this convergent, like divergent and convergent thinking uh, around mm -hmm. design, right? And it's, so, so they need to diverge and we want them to create all these scenarios, but then they, they got to converge and there's a process to that, um, like Melinda was explaining. But, this, this concept uh, sort of methodological mm -hmm. wise of this type of thinking is also a good practice. It's good that they experience like, oh, there's too many options. So how do I go off about this? And it's, it's a good feeling to practice, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is just fascinating. Thank you. Oh, we're so oh, glad. Well, you, <laughs> <laughs> you two we were definitely the one to our session. <laughs> there's an old there's an old principle in another organization i go to that that <clears throat> you know just it doesn't matter how many people show up whoever showed up is the right audience <laughs> yeah. absolutely yeah definitely and and my first time i presented I, I i got a sunday morning first session and it was like two people in the audience uh besides my co-presenter. <laughs> like, oh well. <laughs> oh well. You know, I'd rather, exactly. I'd rather two quality people than, you know, <laughs> 10 who are looking at their phone at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, 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 was, yeah, it was a really great session. I learned a lot. Yeah. It, and it's an awesome idea. Thank you very much for sharing it. Yeah. My head hurts at the moment because you've given me seven different ideas. <laughs> it fires things, eh? Yeah. yeah.
That's good. Yeah. Well, thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you. We have a have lovely a good evening. Thank evening you. Over there. See ya. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye.